Good morning, everyone. What a wonderful, lively group we have. Welcome. I'm Jennifer Bernstein. I'm the president here at the New York Botanical Garden, and it is such a pleasure to welcome all of you back to Ross Hall and to this very special event with Maya Lynn and Edwina Van Gaal. We are situated at the New York Botanical Garden, which is located in the ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. We honor them and acknowledge their displacement, dispossession, and continued presence. The garden is thrilled to welcome Maya Lin, an artist, architectural designer, and very committed environmentalist whose works defy categorization. From Storm King Wavefield, where the land meets the sea and 11-minute mile, to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, she consistently explores new ways for people to experience the landscape and respond to the environment. Today, she'll discuss her last memorial, the highly experimental and visionary What is Missing, an ongoing multi-site memorial that focuses on attention to extinction and habitat loss and asks the viewer to reconsider nature and the environment at a time that it is absolutely pivotal to do so. After her presentation, Maya will remain on stage and will be joined by landscape designer and founder of the Perfect Earth Project, Edwina Van Gaal. Edwina has collaborated on many projects with Maya, and so she's the perfect person to engage her in a wide-ranging conversation about protecting and restoring habitats, the climate crisis, and our human need to connect with nature. We'll also have time for questions from the audience, and then Maya will move to Ross Gallery, where she will be available for uh, book signings and will be selling books in the, in the lobby as well. Now, please join me in giving a warm garden welcome to Maya Lin. Hi, thank you everyone. Thank you for the warm welcome. Thanks. Uh, uh, this is Smith College before I stepped onto the stage there and we rethought it. And when something looks like this and someone has built addition, is this the laser? Yes. Oh, this was the historic core of it. And they basically took an Olmsted campus that had an upper green and a lower green, and they built a wall. And they divided the entire heart of the campus. So I'm going to talk about one architecture project, one art project, and then I'm going to jump into missing. So we'll just go right in. And so this is what it looks like today. And I was able to put back, sort of a less is more, a smaller footprint building that um, accomplished everything they needed pro programmat programmatically, but also freed up the campus. So now you have absolute access to flow around. Edwina Van Gaal was our landscape artist, architect, designer. And she helped with all the outside spaces, because I do believe architecture shouldn't just be seen as like this object placed in a landscape. I think it opens up to the outside. I love creating outdoor rooms. And Edwina has, I brought her in on many a project and um, she has helped make sure that the projects are beautiful and very sustainable. So she had a really great time working with the horticultural department, the botany department in Smith, discussing what native plants should come in and we can go into that later. But for now, again, as I was saying, this is sort of the site I was given. It was the wall, and they called it sort of a wall. And we were able to convince them we saved the historic, lived off of the footprint of the old foundation, and put back what I call these two jewel boxes with a outdoor amphitheater, a new green to the building right hall right there, and another entry green right there as well. So using the outdoors landscape as a welcoming room to engage with you before you enter the building itself, going inside. And then it is one of the greenest buildings, greenest library buildings um, built today. We just achieved gold lead rating. And part of it is we were able to 
isolate where we had to have the most energy intensity needs for the rare book collection, and then a lot of the library is circulating fresh air in the school years for a lot of the times when you can. So the whole building, envelope, maximizing daylight, uh, collecting groundwater is extremely green throughout. So whenever I touch an architecture project, I am committed to that. And that's sort of how the building looks today. Now, the historic building itself, I think, was also kind of a bit of a horror show. They had put in mezzanines throughout. And so when you walked into the Grand Hall, you were actually in a seven and a half foot high space, and you saw feet of people on the upper level. It was totally bizarre. So we had to basically keep the shell and um, give back a new opening. This is now the way you could go between Wright Hall and the library, and there's an outdoor amphitheater that greets you, so classroom space goes outside. But this is how the space now looks, and um, if you can imagine, this is about where the mezzanine was before, and there's an oculus that cuts all the way through. We were able to calculate that we needed a certain throw and a certain wall to get daylight reflected from the top all the way through, so no matter where you are in the building, natural daylight follows you. And just there's a complete openness, so you can really see through the entire library. And this is the North Jewel Box, which again, I sort of balanced in one jewel box, the books surround you, and in the other one, you, you know, you sort of surround the books. And um, second project I'll talk about is Ghost Forest. Um, again, these are my most recent projects. I basically opened both of them last year. And this is for Madison Square Park, and it took me almost seven years to figure out how I could make a temporary work. I don't tend to work on temporary artworks because it takes a lot to install one of these and almost on principle, I don't want to touch the ground heavily and then have to remove it. So it took me a very long time to figure out, well, what could I do that would kind of go in and easily come out, leave a mark, be there for the summer, whatever. And so as I'm sitting in Colorado, I'm noticing a stand of, of evergreens and they'll get a little bit of red because of beetle kill because of climate change, because the weather, the winters are getting too warm, and within three years, the entire area around it is dead. So in talking to Madison Square Park Conservancy, I said what I'd really like to do is bring a ghost forest, which is what they're called, to the middle of Manhattan. But I wanna look at a ghost forest that's being killed off as close to Manhattan, so we sadly didn't have to look too far. This is the Pine Barrens in New Jersey, about, um, 300 miles away, and saltwater inundation, again caused by rising seas and climate change, is taking out vast quantities of these trees. So we basically borrowed a tract that was already being cleared out for the season. And as an artist, I tend to model and model and model because I'm working at a very large scale. And then one day, sighted them. And then for the course of a week last spring, 50, 55 foot tall trees, Atlantic cedars, showed up in Manhattan and I planted them. And the funny thing is I planted them when there were no leaves on the other trees and I watched as through the seasons, deliberately we went through every single season from winter back to winter again when we deinstalled in November. All the trees, because there is an invasive lantern moth, we didn't want them to travel anywhere, though they could have gone anywhere in my book where there were Atlantic cedars at risk to raise awareness. But um, they were, most of the tree was donated to a woodworking shop that makes boats and trains kids in the Bronx to make boats and then sail the boats. So that's where they went. And this is how the forest looked. And as part of it, um, and again, I'm gonna get into what is missing next, because this project is also a part of what is missing. I want to raise awareness of what climate change is doing, but at this moment in time, we are reaching the absolute limit of we have to move and we have to move a lot 
faster than we are. So I didn't want to just make you aware of the terrible tragedy that's going on because of climate change, but I also want to show you nature-based solutions get, that can make a huge difference. So a lot of what, what is missing is about is linking both emissions, a major driver of emissions is land use change, whether it's ranching, agriculture, re deforestation, um, with habitat protection and species protection through planting grasses, trees, restoring wetlands. So we had a thousand trees and shrubs planted throughout the five boroughs in the fall of last year. And we were able to calc that it cost about 5.3 tons of carbon for the three years it took me to figure out and make the piece. And the, over 10 years, the Natural Areas Conservancy in partnership with Madison Square Park figured that um, those thousand trees and shrubs will absorb 60 tons. So we've been able to kind of return tenfold what it took to make the piece. Because again, we have to become part of the solution quite literally in our own backyards, and we'll get to that at the end, Edwina and I. Um, but for now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what um, Jennifer mentioned. Missing, what is missing started almost 20 years ago. I had worked on four other memorials, all called in by people who called me up, um, whether it's the Vietnam, the Women's Table at Yale, um, Civil Rights Memorial, the Confluence Project, on the Pacific Northwest focused on Native American cultural heritage and history intertwined with both environment and Lewis and Clark's history. And for me, I wanted to call into what will be my fifth and last memorial. Um, it's called What is Missing, and it's experimental. It's a work in progress always, but it's focusing us on what we're losing, not necessarily what we've lost that cannot be restored, but we're, we're in the process of losing that if we actually could act, we could help save it. So it's a lot about hope. And it's not just about species, it's about the habitats they need in order to survive. I always like the polar bear because that typifies where we're at. And it is a memorial like water that can jump form it will go to permanent and temporary installations. This is called the empty room. It's traveled to many places around the world. You pick up a piece of optic glass, you go into a black box theater, and you catch a film being hidden projected from the floor. And whether it's talking about the fact that, you know, songbirds are in a 40 to 70% decline, and so literally the sounds we all heard as children growing up, has significantly changed because of this loss, or you know the tuna, we'll, we'll go into that later, or the whale, and the sounds of the whales. But you get to kind of personally connect to a species or place when you hold it in your hands. It started as a commission for the California Academy of Sciences where I created like our master's voice, RCA Victor, a listening cone, and 75 videos produced one to two minute, almost haiku-like videos about species and places, quoting from all the environmental groups, a lot of the scientists. Can I, in a way, share what is being done and what people are observing so that you see all of us as one family in conservation? So it's not like I worked with one group or another, I just worked with everyone, and I quoted from everyone. We got donations of film from Nat Geo, from the BBC, from other small film groups, as well as Cornell Anthology Labs donated and opened up their entire sound library to us. Because as a visual artist, we're very visual. If I can get you to hear it first, it's gonna pique your curiosity. If you see that animal first, as we get older and we have experiences of seeing, we think we know what it is, and we, in a way, stop looking. So deliberately, I use sound to first get you into a video before you actually see and learn about how something is missing. Um, Creative Time gave us the MTV billboard in Times Square. I tend to surface on Earth Day because it's a volunteer project for me. And um, so on Earth Day, I tend to offer one more new iteration of it. One year, Philip Lim had said, would you work on my anniversary show? And I said, well, 
Maybe not, but what if you could do it in benefit of what is missing? So <clears throat> 200 tons of toxin-free organic compost showed up in a warehouse space. I made this, he did that. And then <laughs> the entire Philip Wim staff went out to parks in and around Manhattan and repurposed all the compost to community gardens around the five boroughs. And we were able to use Philip's mailing list and send out, oops, you know, what is missing? Soil. Did you know since 1960, one third of all the world's arable land has been lost through erosion? And did you also know regenerative agriculture can revive degraded earth? We then linked to Edwina's project, the Perfect Earth Project, which I will end with at the end, which goes into what is the largest irrigated crop grown in America. The American lawn. And we'll get into that at the end of this conversation because again, I'm gonna bring it back to your own backyard in which each one of us can do. But again, Ghost Forest was part of missing. So online there is a website called whatismissing.org. Again, probably a very stupid idea, but I threw that website up as soon as I started working on this project, and it keeps changing, and it keeps changing, and it's almost like, oh my God, does an artist expose her sketchbook in every iteration? So as you see, I needed it to act as a nexus for the project, but I didn't even know. I started with what we're losing. I then went to conservation in action, and I finally, about five years ago, figured past, present, future. Future is called green print, mapping the future. I do believe art, Sometimes can sh if we can see and imagine plausible future scenarios, plausible is hugely important, we can achieve it. But I think a lot of us feel there's nothing I can do. What can one person do? So a lot of what I'm going to tell you now is sort of a thought exercise about that. But now is, this is how the website is presently looking. Uh, we had a little glitch in December. Edwina is on my board of what is missing. Uh, she knows about the glitch. But again, we went from being kind of like a video game approach, searchable, and you kind of didn't know how to navigate it, to something very simple on the bottom left and the bottom right when you go to whatismissing. Oh, I can't figure out the, the, uh, the pointer. You now say explore the world, and you can look at thousands and thousands of stories of the natural world, past and present, and then solutions is what we're still building. But again, as an artist, can I get you to be aware of things that you might not even realize are disappearing? And then you have to ask yourself the question, how can we protect something if we don't even realize it's missing? So whether it's the scale of species, the abundance of species, the longevity of the species, all of these issues are disappearing so I'm not really here to talk about a dodo bird. And then, you know, it's called shifting baselines. You might not realize because we know what we know in our moment in time, or we know what we know on the point in the river we're at, but do we really realize that in the 1890s, a cod was larger than a man. No, we know a cod that may be this big. And so again, how can we realize, how can we protect it if, if indeed we don't even know it is gone? So there are in-depth timelines that you can, there is over a thousand timelines now, cities, species, waterways. We have chosen to live where there is great abundance. The first thing that happens, especially with the waterways, is we pollute with sewage. And then, like in London, the stink, the famous stink in London shut down Parliament. And then we become aware of it with industrial pollution. We begin to enact legislation. And lo and behold, nature is intensely resilient. And if we give it a chance, it can come back. So it goes into, like, say, New York City, it's cleaner now than it's been in 400 years, same with the Thames. So this importance to emphasize how conservation and how nature can rebound if we protect it. So just since we're all near New York and we're in New York, the pears were larger than a fist, the wild turkeys weighed 40 pounds, the lobsters were six feet long. 
why do we want to make you aware? Because I think we should be almost gobsmacked how incredibly wonderful the world has been and how we could try to protect it and bring it back. Um, this great expert at the Natural History Museum, I am blanking on his name, um, said, oh God, Adrian Vanderdunk, he exaggerates. The lobsters were only five feet long. <laughs> Just, and so this is literally, you know, half the world's oysters came from Manhattan. They began to taste like petroleum. They can't even grow there, and now they're beginning to make a comeback. But what we also do, again, think about your own backyard is, and everybody here owes me a memory, or if you're young, you can in interview your parents and your grandparents. I want You want to go back in time on a personal level. Share a memory with us, something you or your parents or your grandparents personally have told you about loss or about recovery in the natural world. Because again, if we cannot connect back to how nature affects each one of us, then maybe we're less inclined to try to protect it. So there you go. You go to whatismissing.org, share a memory, and please share one with us. That being said, solutions is where we are now. And again, I truly believe, like whether it's the elevator, the escalator, the rocket to the moon, sometimes if we can imagine it, we can then achieve it. So everything I'm going to focus on now is giving you a sense that this is scalable and we can solve this. Time is running out, but just a few things. So on the site right now, we go through, whether it's agriculture, forestry, wetlands, we show you what it looks like today, how much emissions are being emitted, and then we show you what happens if we reform farming, ranching, change our diet, reduce and absorb, and then you can go into an in-depth solution overview, and it can tell you how much um, how much emissions we can actually start absorbing. So in, especially with the life of the soil, we can turn a carbon emitter into a carbon sink. And that is key critical. And since we're at the New York Botanic Garden, it's the potential of the soil. And you can look at it as a globe, or you can look at it as a flat map. So for me, missing is about that in-between area. It's 49% of all our emissions as well as the major driving threats of biodiversity loss. So to me, I came up with a phrase, we can save two birds with one tree by restoring our habitats, by attacking what are the land use practices presently to, in practice today. And this is where through like Drawdown, the Nature Conservancy, the Climate Foundation, this is what 45 to 90% of annual greenhouse gas emissions could be offset whether it's forests, ocean farming, croplands, wetlands. And you could then free up lands to give it back to nature, which is, again, hugely important, eminently doable. So now we're going to do a little bit of a thought exercise. So it's called What If? It's part of Green Print of Envisioning a Sustainable Future. I got some Dalton kids here. So they are the only group that has ever answered the question correctly. If we all lived at the population density of Manhattan, how much space would 7.6 billion people take up? Any answers? I, I'm sorry, I put you guys on the spot. OK. I want to hear some answers. Close, you've done it again. It's like everyone says something much larger. Right now, it's the state of Arizona. When I first started this a few years ago, it was the state of Colorado. We've got a few more people on the planet from 7.3 to 7.6. But so what is the answer then? What is the real question? Is this really about population or is this about land use and resource consumption? So we go into this, and we just try to get you to scale it. Because when I show the slide, people go, that's it? So could we imagine rearranging the lights? Could we densify our urban areas? Could we free up more rural space? Could we give back to nature? Could we share the planet? So here are some other, you know, I like to play 20 questions. What if we could curb climate change? So according to the World Economic Forum, we need about 1.6 trillion annually to mitigate and offset or to mitigate climate change. So take a look at what we spend our money on. Yeah, everyone always goes to defense, but <clears throat> there's always alcohol. 
or you could add up tobacco, drug trafficking, and meetings in the US. So I think the question is when someone says, oh my god, it, we're spending too much money, we're spending the money every year. And what we're doing is we're spending our future and our kids' futures and your kids' futures. And it's just, you've kind of got to have a sense of humor about this at this point because we could turn this around. We're spending the money annually. So then we pull out another question. What if we rethought our priorities? So I'm just going to let you guys play with this one for a second. I'm not going to read through it, but just take a read. Can everyone read that? I, I just love the Halloween candy, <laughs> or the US pet industry versus, again, don't let anyone tell you, oh, it's too much money to change this. It's like, look at what we're spending our money on. So again, don't think the individual and the individual consumer doesn't make a huge difference. And you know what we buy, when we buy it, how much we buy is just part of it. So all these slides are on the website, and you can download them and share them. The only trouble is my website is having a little bit of a glitch, so it might take you a little while to find it. I apologize. I think it's under solutions and then under green print. So, and if it's not there, it'll get there by September, I promise you. Um, so you have to beg the question, why can't defense include defending the planet? And this is the one I really, really love. What is it about us that now that we think we've messed up this planet, so now we're going to fly to another planet? It, it drives me crazy. It just does. Sorry, guys. Um, so we do like to do thought exercises in land use and area. So how much space would it take to power the world with renewable energy, wind power, solar, and then take it back to the US? The amount of area needed to offset our entire electricity need with solar panels is this, which just happens to be equivalent to all our parking lots. I'm a firm believer, I know, you th it's cheaper to throw the solar array in a field, but now you've robbed the field of being a biodiverse habitat. We have the built environment. We just have to put more panels on them. Anyway, so then we do go around the world and talk about reducing our energy footprint. So there's energy solutions and land-based solutions. And also we go into individual actions, the what you can do. I promise by September it'll be but a lot easier to find these. But you've just got to understand who's consuming the planet. And so there you go. Um, it's just we have to look at what we're doing and how we're kind of over-consuming the planet. Can't resist talking about diet a little bit. So I'm someone who basically says, OK, what if you ate 20% less meat and less cattle? What would that look like? Now, that frees up enough land that's equivalent to all the protected land in North America and half in South America. Or I always send this out at Easter. I know people get upset with me. Um, but what do rabbits have in common with the Mississippi River? Answer. Now, look at the land area you would save. <laughs> so again, I'm hoping you're laughing because I think what Missing is trying to do is from an artist's point of view, I, am, I, I was on the board of NRDC for years. I love the groups and I want to showcase and we don't ask anything of you except give us a memory. But what we do is, really? This is what we're doing? And so I just love this because just it's a, it's a thought experiment and maybe it's a way an artist can maybe rephrase it and juxtapose things that you aren't quite thinking of but gets you to Hopefully, feel like, oh, wow, we, we could do something about this. Anyway, I want to get on to Edwina's talk. I'm running long. Um, but I will leave you with a couple things we could all leave here, and you never have to go back to drinking um, coffee the wrong way. <laughs> this is the difference in species between a shade-grown plantation versus a plantation. And it's 10 cents a cup more, maybe, not even. But look what you're doing for habitat and biodiversity. Or I love this one. 
largest crop economically grown in the world, probably caused greater loss of biodiversity than any other single crop. So agave, organic sugar, and this is the difference between a plantation versus a sustainable plantation. So, and we bring it home to where sugar is grown, and then we'll be linking to animals at risk in these areas. But again, I'm just, I have one video, and then I'm gonna segue into Edwina. But again, we're after nature-based solutions, emphasizing that we can save two birds with one tree, and if you protect a wetland, you actually save three birds with one tree because you also protect yourself and buffer yourself from rising seas. So I'm just gonna play this video. Oops, it should start playing. Maybe not. Mirror. So this is what also we sent out when I did the Philip Wim thing, you know, what is the largest irrigated crop grown in America? The American lawn, and this is what you're exposed to if it is not organic and toxin-free. But you might not know this fun fact. Um, more gasoline was spilled, is spilled each year refueling lawn equipment than was spilled at the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And this was the link to the Perfect Earth Project where what if you gave half your lawn back to nature? And I think Edwina and I are gonna talk about, you know, and then these are all practices you can do to bring your lawn to become a toxin-free organic lawn. And just to give you an idea of the capacity, 2% of all land is devoted to just lawns. And that doesn't include the shrubs and the forests and the grass. So we all actually 
have a huge amount of power to affect change in our own backyard. So I kind of want to bring it back to that. And um, Edwina, I think we are up. I'm just going to leave one slide up for her. This is two ways where Edwina has wonderfully you know, given most of her, these lawns back to nature. Um, I think the quote is, from wall to wall to an area rug. And then we'll leave two thirds for the birds up, which is her dedicated project focused on exactly, I hope, what, what this conversation goes to. But thank you guys all, and I think I'll sit over here. I guess the first thing to start this off was that, yeah, you've been doing this a long time, and a lot has changed. Yeah. But then not enough has changed. And so how do you think your, what you're asking people to do now has changed and where we really stand with that now? Well, I think, and again, full confession, like Edwina's helped me at Storm King, at Princeton, at Smith Library. Um, I think when I started with some of my projects, like my first wave field was for the University of Michigan, I didn't even think about it. And I just put in a very intensive lawn and I actually owe them a call back because I want to go in and see what we can do to make it more sustainable. And then every earthwork after that, I learned and I learned. And then university campuses were at first very reluctant to change their land use, land maintenance practices. And now they're like, Princeton was like, oh, we do compost tea. They knew all about it. So I think, I think things have shifted and changed in a great way, I think. There is a little fear, too little, too late. You know, we could turn this around, and the beauty of nature-based solutions is whether you're protecting the ocean or the land, nature you know, can rebound within three to five years. By 10 years, it's in a different place. So I think there's time, but we are running out of time. I do think the mindset is shifting, but I'd love to know from your end, because she's in the front lines working with contractors and clients, and is to, to me, like because I work a lot on college campuses, I think they're, they know more now, and they're, they move quicker. I'm just curious from your point of view, what how, do you see a shift? Because I've definitely seen a, a shift for the good that way. Oh, completely, because I used to be a little on the weird side. And, <laughs> and now people actually want to hear from me, which is very nice. And it's a, and it's a shift in a larger way way as well, because originally environmentalism was all about policy. Policy remains really important, but I think people are starting to recognize, and it sort of goes along in an interesting way with the, with the shift in thinking about climate change is now engulfing biodiversity. And at the same time, yeah. human change is engulfing the, is, is including the individual. We as individuals will be the change. Without us and without the organizations that we run ourselves. So it's more a, it's an apolitical decision making process. And ideally, it's, it's less financially driven. We know that financial is a really important component that drives every market. But in landscapes, it doesn't have to. So we really are looking towards individuals making decisions, starting in their own yards. You, when you feel that difference that you make, when everybody smiles, every time Maya talks about how her own land in Colorado got transformed, she lights up. Yeah, this yeah. is normal, and this is really good. And people will bring that out into the world with them, and it'll trickle up. Obviously, on the organizational and municipal level, we need to trickle down as well. Right. But that's the difference now, that we are empowering people. Cool. Yeah. Another question. Let's do another question. <laughs> another question. Well, yeah, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about um, your experience yourself, you know, in terms of how it's, because I think that people love process. They love to know that someone else has done it and what it, that it wasn't always easy and about perception? Well, I, I mean, I think for me, it, for a lot of the earthworks I've done, um, I think people, and again, if you're coming at it from the art world, I think there there is more um, acceptance and interest in you're kind of pushing it somewhere. 
Uh, I think Missing is an interesting one because it, it is an NGO, but it's also this guerrilla art project. So I think for me, I, I'm sure a lot of people still think I'm pretty crazy with it. Um, but bellwether change, like when Ghost Forest comes up, huge difference that I had put in at Storm King after Wayfield, I had put something in called The Secret Life of Grasses. And we took three clear tubes, 18 feet tall, and I planted three grasses. One called Kernza, all developed by the Land Institute in Kansas. So it's a perennial wheat, yeah. And so because every year we till out the gardens, we till out the, our crops, at which point we're eroding all the soil. So if you can come up with and promote a perennial crop, then you're not tilling and over-tilling and causing all your land to blow away. Uh, and I did two native grasses because again, what people might not realize is that the roots of a prairie grass, a medium and tall grass, goes 18 feet deep. And it's absorbing so much carbon in the complexity of the soil and the life of the soil. And so we had a whole education program on that. And I, I think it just was almost like head scratching. People didn't quite understand why I was so obsessed with the Soil Food Network. And then you go to, and that was maybe 10 years ago, versus today with Ghost Forest, our first kickoff, it wasn't an art symposium, it was a symposium with Edwina. It was a symposium with the Rodale Institute, which has done some of the great studies on how much agriculture and regenerative agriculture can bring back the life of the soil, make your soil resilient, feed more people. And then Nature Conservancy talking about their restoration work. And it was met with incredible enthusiasm. So I think that is a big bellwether change, just even in the last decade. And I, I'm pretty excited about that, but again, you can't get too excited about it because opening up the paper a few days ago and it's like the oceans are losing their ability with ocean acidification to really act as, I mean, 70% of our oxygen, oxygen comes from the oceans. And when, let's assume we're in the sixth extinction of the planet and the ones where the oceans die off is when you have a 99% die off of life on the planet. So in a way, we're heading towards one of those extinction events. So I don't know why we are all not just going, oh, we have to all do something about it. And I think we can't, I think sometimes governments are the slowest to move, but the beauty is there is intense power in how we can choose what we buy, what we don't buy, hugely important. I mean, how we can send massive messages. And again, back to you, just go to your own backyard, look at what's going on in your lawns and your gardens and go, how can I do this so I'm not taking all these pesticides and fertilizers and just sending them basically into the watershed and making areas, I think you're, you're two thirds for the birds you know, how do we share with nature? How do we give back to nature? And I think I'd love to hear more from you about how, like, Two Thirds for the Birds, you've gone from Perfect Earth Project to Two Thirds for the Birds. Where did your thinking come in that? Because I think we're both in the same place where you have to think of the two twinned, and it's through the key is habitat restoration and protection. So I'd love your thoughts on how you went from Perfect Earth to Two Thirds for the Birds. Well, perfect earth is still perfect there. earth. And, 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 but when I read about the bird decline, and at the same time, um, Doug Talmy had given me an early manuscript of his book, um, The Last, what is it, Nature's Best Hope, to read, and I realized he had a solution. He, he was putting science behind our just sort of generalist, oh, it'd be nice to plant more native plants. He gave it a number, and I like science. And it, it, so I could say to people, his science shows if you have 70% native plants in your backyard and you do not use pesticides, you are actually solving the problem of the bird decline. And once you know this, how could you not? Like, 
How, how could you really not? So, and birds are a whole lot more charismatic than plants in those things. I know I'm at the Botanic Garden, but and I know I'm not supposed to say this. I am a, my spirit animal is a plant, <laughs> but what can I say? Um, I know that this is, there are certain things, you know, and so I thought, oh, well, 70% is like two thirds and it rhymes with birds. Let's create a call to action. So two thirds is like my call to action. Perfect or still is about the action. How does it work? What can you do? How can we bring people together? But, but two thirds is a community. So the, it's simply a website where people share their experiences and their names with each other so that you could find someone as it gets more robust. You find somebody that's in your state or in your area that shares your commitment. There is no regulation. There's no way to regulate whether or not people are doing it. And that's the beauty of the individual. We aren't working from a law. We're working from our heart. We're working from what we absolutely know we got to do. And, and it's from a place of joy. And once somebody gets over their anxiety about having the perfect lawn or the, and treating their landscape as if it were their living room, like it has to be vacuumed, but in this case, we blow it. You know, like if you have a living room landscape, a, a leaf on your lawn is like dirt on your rug. It, you know, it doesn't fit, I agree. But maybe you have to change what your landscape is going to look like and the models, so I'm, also reaching out to all the people who are the influencers, and we're all influencers in some way, but how can we all step out there and create a whole new paradigm, what a, what a landscape looks like? And what Perfect Earth will give you is the information about what does, what are the essential ingredients of a landscape that you know is helping the health of the earth, not hurting it. So that's the first thing is do can, no harm. Can you go through, like, because like I put up your perfect at the points. Would you mind just sharing with the audience just the simple points about, so you anyone can do it. I did it in Colorado. I was so excited. But just some of the points that you've told me from iterating to the, if, would well, you mind doing a, the seven step? Okay. Like, <laughs> yeah, we have something called the 10 commitments, but they're changing all the time. So, cause it's really more than that. <laughs> but so I can, I can wing it a bit. Um, but basically the, the basic premise is do no harm. And so every life form counts. So sit down for a sec and imagine and, you know, reopen yourself to the fact is that we are not the supreme beings on earth. We are just one part of the, of the web of life. And take out any part of the web of life, it's a cascading effect. So when you go into your yard, and this is something I learned from Rebecca McMacken at Brooklyn Bridge Park, is that she has a rule there. So this is a new commandment that we made, is that do not kill anything if you don't know its name. <laughs> and, like they've discovered rare species in the park, which otherwise would have been weeded out because they hadn't, but these are things that have not been seen in New York City for maybe over a hundred years. But if her landscape team weeding didn't say, I've never seen that before, looks like a weed, but I'm not pulling it because I don't know, I don't know what it is. And that's how it's working. And the same thing is working for bees and butterflies and all the bugs in your garden. If you don't know what it is, um, and the other thing is that is thinking differently. Well, and another one is um, just a, an extension of that is don't spray, like no spraying. So we spend umpteen millions of dollars every year hiring tree specialists to come in and prune our trees. So deadwood removal is something that we really discourage, so that's another thing. Leave deadwood, that's a bird feeder. Um, trees are fine with deadwood in them, it's actually part of the food web. Standing dead trees are snags, that's where cavity nesting birds lived before we made birdhouses, and they're still rather happier there. <laughs> and they're really fun to watch because they just, they just become this amazingly wonderful evolution. And so then uh, 
we, we pay people to take our leaf surface away. It goes to the dump where it, it puts off methane, very powerful greenhouse gas. And then we freak out if a caterpillar eats a leaf. Um, explain that. You know, so that's the process. It's really about what we did thinking. in Colorado is like what started naturally aerating the land, and then we, you know, we mow um, a little more frequently because you want the little clippings, and then you leave them there for the, you know, you're all probably doing this. Um, and we, I, we just, I cut my lawn in half. And so we took in all the perimeters, and then I started to train the roots deeper by just not watering them all the time, at which point it goes a little dormant every now and again, but it's fine. And it, it just all of a sudden, I, it, and there was a few other tenants like that. that Proper would, water. It's, those yeah. are the basics. Allow clover. My grandson pointed out to me that um, there's a word in the middle of the word clover that's love. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> And, and so um, that picture with the dog, uh, that's my dog, Clover. <laughs> and, and so, and yeah, but that's, no, it's... Uh, it's tenants it, really yes. make a difference. One thing people don't actually realize that there, there's a chart that always shows the difference between lawn grass roots and all other roots. When the soil's right, lawn grass roots are actually very deep. Yeah. But most people don't water properly. Their water seldom... I mean, they water frequently and short term, so people think that's saving water. Um, the biggest thing you could do when you leave today is turn off your irrigation system and do not turn it on until sometime toward the end of June when we actually are, when the, when the ground is dry, and then only use it when you absolutely know that your lawn is, is suffering, and, it, and then turn it on long enough so that the water goes down six to eight inches. You really should, your irrigation specialist should not be setting your clock. That's, that they're not a lawn specialist. They set the, every clock in your entire neighborhood for the same amount of time, regardless of the weather or your particular conditions. And especially out west where we are, it's like then your, your grasses aren't resilient. They'll die at the first, you know, we're going through massive droughts, so just training our, the grasses off, off water, just it, those tap roots go way down and they're much more hardy. Crops the same way, it's like, you know, we should be all drip irrigating. I mean, we should also be growing crops where there is water and we're gonna have to really rethink what we grow and where we grow it. Because I think water is becoming a much larger issue, especially out west and around the world. And I think we are, you know, we've also kind of reduced our crops to very few crops. So we're again, very vulnerable to disease if one of these crops fails. So I think the diversification of crops, and for me, it's like backyard. And then the second thing is agriculture. Everyone talks about how the agricultural industry, and it is an industry, is so heavily subsidized for the large institutions and what we really need to do is start, you have to kind of promote supporting the smaller local groups that are doing the right thing because we have left ourselves very vulnerable to huge swings in climate, which is what is beginning to happen. So if we can bring back the life of the soil, then that soil can withstand a two to three to four year drought cycle a lot better than this seriously, like let's face it, with industrial fertilizers, you've burnt out any life in the soil, so you have to keep throwing that industrial chemical in. And it basically, within time, that soil is absolutely not able to grow anything. So I think that's where Rodale Institute has done all these studies that show if you really want to make yourself um, more protected from these massive changes in climate and droughts and make our food supply more stable, then we have to start really talking about regenerative agriculture practices. And I think people just think, it's sort of like it's not sexy as a solution, but it, it is, it's again vital to how we are going to really feed ourselves and maintain some sense of stability around the world. I mean, we are, we are leaving ourselves wide open to, we're so vulnerable and just 
just looking at where we are today in the world, I mean, it's, it's gonna get more and more difficult to grow crops in certain areas. And, and this is something we could be changing around now. We're just not focusing on it, I think. I think it's pretty sexy. Yeah, I'm glad you do. <laughs> just, just, it's like, I think they'd rather send a rocket to, the, to Mars. I don't quite get that thinking. It's just, could we ch please try to rethink how we're growing our food and where we're growing our food? Anyway. Because well, people are now building beetle banks and all in, in a regenerative farm. They're, they're bringing the pollinators back in by creating strips. And those are, I, mean, I think that's one of the things that's really changed is the bee lobby or whatever you want to say, the BPR. Yeah, the B, BPR. <laughs> because people, care people about bees. originally they would tell me, I do not want to plant in my landscape that will attract bees. I, I really don't think anybody's saying that anymore. They'd be embarrassed too. So I, we hope that people will be embarrassed to have big lawns that don't have any diversity. Right. Um, and, that, and we can change that. We can simply little by little erode that. We look to our most visible institutions to set the parameters for what is a good landscape. That's important. The pe where do people look for that? When they are looking at their each other's lawns, what kind of um, support are we giving the person with the nature-based landscape to say to their neighbors, oh yeah, but this is cutting edge. This is what's in fashion. Look at Architectural Digest, or look at this magazine, or look at that Instagram. That's, you'll, this is what's happening now. This is the sexy part. And so, that's good. <laughs> and that's, that's where we're going, and it's working. It's just, there's still, of course, so um, I was talking to Debbie Edelstein. She's the director of the Native Planet Trust, and she said that she became, she didn't know anything really about gardening when she started there. And so she let her yard go to native plants. And little by little, she's replacing a crabgrass lawn with um, native plants. And everybody in her neighborhood was aghast. Then one other small house on her block was purchased by a young couple who got into it. They did it. They got so into it, they collected seeds from her yard and started growing native plants and having a native plant sale in the neighborhood each year. It's blossomed. <laughs> and we could all do that. I mean, it's, it's never, a, there's always a way. There's just, there's always a way. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much to both of you, please.